your truth with life strategist Laura T. Real advice for regular people. Now, here's Laura. Oh, and welcome to Own Your Truth, where we're talking real advice for regular people. I'm Laura T. Thank you so much for listening. I know there's lots of ways you can spend your time, and I am grateful you're going to spend the next hour with me. So grab a pen and paper because tonight's topic is Mind Your Mindset, how to keep a positive mindset during these changing times. I'm going to give you some tips and some tools, and you may even want to write them down. So really, really, truly get up, grab your pen and paper now. My topic tonight, Mind Your Mindset. I think it's important to share my decision to discuss this topic um, because I came at it a little differently than I normally come up my uh, show topics. The idea came from um, a couple of weeks ago. I was personally struggling with the changes to our day-to-day lives. I, I have to admit, I was upset that as a solopreneur, someone who works from home for the past four years, that I had finally gotten into a groove of getting out of the house regularly, and then all of a sudden it ended. I was unsettled, having family invade my home office space. My office is this really great loft above our kitchen, so you can imagine how disrupting it is to have people coming in just to get something as simple as food while I'm on coaching calls. And, you know, I have to be honest, I was disheartened by the way the media and people on social media were expressing the need for change through fear and judgment. And then I would go through these waves where I was disappointed in myself because, I mean, after all, my job is to help people get through changing times and come out the other side stronger and healthier. And here I am upset that things are changing for me. I was really frustrated. I was stuck at home and I didn't even know how I could help. It took me four days of processing these feelings. And because I practice what I coach, I didn't push down how I was feeling. I allowed myself to express it. And, you know, my poor family, they had to listen to my rants. And I'm grateful they did. Because it was through that expression, I was able to get to a place where I could ask myself, what do I want during this time? How do I want to show up? And when I was asking myself these questions, they weren't rhetorical. They were really important. And so I journaled my answers. What do I want? I want to be productive. So I created what I call hashtag Corona goals. These are things I wouldn't normally be able to do because I didn't have time. I wanted to coach and help more people. So I'm offering a month of free coaching for anyone who's been furloughed or lost their job. I'm going to give some more details about that toward the end of the show. And I wanted to enjoy this time with my family. You know, I'd like to say we were, like, spending really great time together playing games. But the truth is we're binge-watching a ton of TV and we're really enjoying it. So then I answer the question, how do I want to show up during this time? I want to show up peaceful, kind, understanding, resourceful, helpful, and energetic. And so part of my coaching and helping more people is this show. I'm here talking about Mind Your Mindset in these changing times because the only thing we really have control over is how we think about our current circumstance. Now notice I use the word changing times, not challenging times. A challenge is what you bring to a changing situation. If we look at the change as neutral and we don't give it a judgment, We get to own our choice and decide how to move forward. My personal story is a perfect example of how you can choose to own that choice. The reality is things are always changing. And when the change is perceived as good, I have my air quotes, we appreciate the change. And ironically, sometimes we don't even notice it. And it's easy for us to adjust accordingly. However, When our brains see the change as bad, again, air quotes, or it seems threatening, mental alarm sounds, and our response ranges from fear to anger to sadness and everything in between. I'm going to go into more detail about why the brain does that a little bit later in the show. As you can see, the real challenge is not the situation. The real challenge is consciously choosing our response to the changing situation instead of unconsciously reacting to whatever we see, hear, or feel. So let's talk about how people feel. 
In studying human behavior, which is what I do, and I'm blessed to have worked with thousands of people um, through the use of assessments, I think it's worth mentioning everyone's behavioral style, everyone's behavior is a gift until it's at its extreme, at which, at which point it becomes a detriment. And so I often use an analogy when I'm explaining this to people. I use the analogy of, a pe of chocolate cake. If you eat one piece of chocolate cake, it's delicious. When you eat a whole chocolate cake, you want to throw up. Well, the truth is, too much of our behavior, or when we're at an extreme, it kind of makes other people want to throw up, right? I mean, I'm kind of kidding, but not really. So what pushes our behavior to extreme? Well, it's easy. Things that cause pressure, tension, stress, and fatigue in all of their many forms. And as you know, we don't need a pandemic to, ex to be experiencing those emotions. But the difference between now and when we traditionally experience these emotions is that there's so many people feeling this level of pressure, tension, stress, or fatigue at the same time. And we're not taught how to manage our behavior. I mean, most of us don't naturally know how to step back and as observe how we're showing up. And it's la this lack of awareness that tends to make us unsympathetic to how we're viewing others' behavior. And it further increases the negativity brought on by changing situations. And you're going to notice throughout the night, I'm going to refer to COVID-19 as simply a changing situation. It's just a change. And we're going to talk about ways to adjust to it. So let's come back to this notion of behavior. At this point, you may be saying, like, what the heck is she talking about? Well, let me give you some examples of how qualities we admire in someone when they're at their best can be seen as a negative when under pressure, tension, stress, or fatigue. So, for example, people who you admire for being, let's say, a team player can, can be perceived as unconcerned under pressure, tension, stress, or fatigue because they're quietly observing and looking for consensus from others. People who are thoughtful may appear hesitant because they're weighing out all the possible scenarios or options. People who are optimistic could appear unrealistic because they're looking for the bright side or dreaming about options not yet available. People who are dependable appear to be stubborn because they're focused on proof and what they know is often based on the past and they don't want to change. People who are assertive can seem abrasive because they're direct and to the point. And people who are pioneering can easily be viewed as nervy because they're willing to take risks others wouldn't. These are just a few of the examples of how it's easy to see every behavior at its best can be a detriment under changing times. And yet we need to be open we need to open this perspective on ourselves and on each other to show up kind, to show up curious, and to show up caring. Okay, well, so understanding how our behavior changes during these times is helpful, but what can we do about it? Well, here's the cool thing. Most people think they can't do anything, right? You're kind of just stuck in however you feel. Well, the truth is there's this rule, it's called the 90 second rule. And this rule indicates there's a 90-second chemical process that happens in the body after a person has a reaction to something in their environment. After that, any remaining emotional response is the person choosing to stay in that emotional loop. That's really important to remember. So to kind of summarize it and make it really simple, you can change the first thought that comes into your mind. You can't change, pardon me, you can't change the first thought that comes into your mind, but you can control every thought thereafter. This is the key to minding your mindset, not just today, but also going forward. And so let's step back one more bit and let's take a, let's take a look at this on a larger scale. How much control does an individual's mindset have on their happiness? Well, according to Sonia Lombarski, author of How the how of happiness and leading psychologist in the science and study of happiness, it's actually more than you think. So based on her studies, 50% of our happiness is what she describes as a set point. Basically, it's dependent on our genes. We're born with it. 
The next percent, 10 percent, is determined by our circumstances. It could be illness, tragedy, loss. And then 40 percent of our happiness is intentional activity, meaning that you get to decide what you want to do to improve your happiness. Well, it sounds simple, right? Intentional activity will increase our happiness. Well, if it's that easy, then why isn't everybody happy? Well, having something sound simple doesn't mean it's easy to implement. And there's a couple of reasons why people aren't happy. First off, like any muscle, the mindset muscle needs to be nourished and exercised daily. And I don't know about you guys, but, it, you know, I look at that and go, oh, my gosh, you know, I've already got so much on my plate. I don't, I don't know where, where I'm going to find time for this. So it ends up as something added to our to-do list. Another reason people aren't implementing this simple notion of being happy is because we're not taught what will make us happy. And in fact, often the things will make us happy, like more money, a more fit body, a better job, a different spouse, they don't impact our happiness at all. And this is after study after study. There's literally no impact on long-term happiness based on those, those things that we think will make us happy. So what does make us happy? Well, this idea of minding your mindset is key, and I'm going to share some specific ways to do that later in the show. I mentioned at the start of the show, I was disheartened by how the media and social media are responding to today's changes. Although I am admittedly an overly optimistic person, I'm not unrealistic. With that, I don't think the, ne the news needs to be happy and cheerful or that given our current circumstances, the changes we're making in our day to day aren't necessary. What I do believe is the language used to induce fear is unnecessary and science shows it doesn't work in changing behavior long term. Instead, it induces what we see, short-term panic and, on, sadly, um, social shaming, especially on social media. So let's talk about the use of fear, why our brains respond to it, um, but it's totally ineffective for changing behavior. All right, let's start at the beginning. Why do we go to such great lengths to construct dire images and worst-case scenarios that make us feel dreadful? This is a terrific question asked and answered by Harvard psychologist Dan Daniel Gilbert. He says, first, there's the belief that by anticipating unpleasant events, we can minimize their impact. This is true for so many people. The second, he says, fear and worry play useful roles in our lives. We use it to motivate employees, children, spouses, even our pets, and ourselves. And we do this to get ourselves to do the right thing by dra over-dramatizing the unpleasant consequences. The problem is, studies show fear induces inaction. Inaction. Like lack of action. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. When we're looking to support our fears, we look for facts. And Gilbert says, although the word fact seems to suggest a sort of unquestionable irrefutability, facts are actually nothing more than conjectures that have met a certain standard of proof, right? They're, they're things that we see that meet a certain standard of proof. Gilbert explains that to ensure our views are credible, and this is a crazy thing about the way our brain works, our brain accepts what our eyes sees. To ensure that our views are positive, our eyes look for what our brains want. So it's this loop. You know, they say, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? What comes first? You see it, then you believe it, or you believe it, then you see it. They actually work together in what you want to believe you see and what you see you believe. So I'll add, in the age of technology, proof is easy to come by. And since the amount of proof someone needs is subje subje subjective, anyone can share anything based on their threshold of proof, and it can be easily misinterpreted as fact. Okay, so let's take this a step further. If you've listened to the show before, I often mention this little thing in our brain called the reticular activating system. It's, this, it's the part of our brain that filters the information that gets into our mind. Without it, we would go crazy with the huge amounts of information we encounter each day. 
Most people don't consciously decide what they want to focus on, and instead they focus on their current circumstances. So if you're listening to the news or participating on social media without deciding in advance what you want, you're, su you're subject to receiving whatever messages has been, have been curated by the outlet in which you're getting your information. We are literally absorbing the information around us, consciously as much as unconsciously. So all of this is to say, you get to decide what you're focused on during these changing times. And remember, whatever you focus on, your brain will find information to support it, to create fact. So guard your mindset by feeding yourself information that will help you get to where you want to be right now, that will help you get to the mindset you want to have. Okay, so let's come back to the idea I mentioned a moment ago, where I said fear induces inaction. Well, how do I know that? There's been lots of studies. There's a woman by the name of Tally Sharrett. She has a terrific TED Talk on how to motivate yourself to change your behavior. In her talk, she shares why we're resistant to warnings. Basically, when we're faced with fearful warnings, we're like animals. And animals don't fight or flight like we do. They freeze or they flee. So if you think about freezing, we put our head in the ground until it's too late. And you can see that happen with past situations like the housing market, right, or the stock market. Um, or we flee. And when we flee, we're often using rationalizations to feel more resilient than before. So fearful messages actually make us feel stronger in the opposite way. That's why when you tell people not to stop smoking, it doesn't work. It's really finding ways to have people see the circumstances differently. She also shares studies that compare our ability to learn from warnings versus our ability to learn from good news. Results show we are least likely to learn from warnings when we are kids and teenagers, and again as elderly people. You know, when I learned this, I thought, well, really, is it any surprise all the teenagers on the beaches in Florida during spring break? Not at all. They're not learning from these warnings. It's natural that we're not. It's a natural response. Here's the thing. Our ability to learn from good news remains the same throughout our lifetime. Because in general, all people tend to take in information they want to hear and ignore information they don't want to hear. So it's so it sounds so logical, and yet that's the, not the way that we're getting information about this or even past situations of change. So it should be no surprise there isn't full buy-in during this time. Well, here's the good news. In this talk, Sherrod has discovered three ways to create change in people. And again, she shares these great studies, um, positive results from this shift in how you get people to change behavior. Um, the first thing is social incentives. Social incentives she describes as uh, tracking progress toward improvement has a great impact on changing behavior and the social incentive in showing people about that progress. So instead of, I'm going to use some examples from today, instead of tracking fear-based numbers like those who have contracted the virus, which are often shared without context, if communities tracked progress of social distancing and improvements in sanitary measures, it would have a greater impact. Another suggestion she's seen work is immediate rewards. And these don't have to be physical rewards. Simple things like community pride and keeping people safe would be an example of immediate reward. Celebrating communities that are excelling in stay safe, stay home efforts. These are simple things that scientifically have been proven to have an impact. Her final suggestion is progress monitoring. And that's highlighting progress toward the goal instead of instilling a fear of loss if people don't take action. Seeing improvements rather than death tolls is key to getting people to stay home. Sherrod mentions giving people a sense of control is, really, is a really important motivator. When you look at our current approach, it's easy to understand how the loss of control people are feeling now has them more helpless and resisting change. 
I'm going to share um, Sherrod's TED Talk on the Own Your Truth with Laura T. Facebook page. So please check it out. This is a really informative 12-minute um, segment worth your time and will get you thinking, again, think differently, not just about now, about after. And how do you want to get, whether it's your children, whether you're a coach and you want to get your athletes to make change, whether you're someone working on your health, the way to make change is through positive versus fear-based. Okay. Now, let's get to tonight's Own Your Truth Musical Artist of the Week. I am excited to bring back a repeat artist to the show. He's stirring up a lot of buzz around the state and beyond. Brian Jarvis is a Connecticut-based singer-songwriter who exemplifies a man living his dream and making it happen. He toured with Carly Simon, collaborated with Brendan James, and with chart-topping artists like Andy Grammer and Rachel Platten. Tonight, we're going to take a listen to one of the songs that truly touched my heart, his song, Anyone at All. Back to tonight's topic, Mind Your Mindset. Before the break, I shared the impact fear has on behavior and provided some alternatives. Now we're going to talk about the importance of language on your mindset. 
You're going to want to have your paper and pencil ready uh, because I'm, as I talk, I'm going to have you do a couple of exercises at home. All right. So first, if you've got your piece of paper, because the visuals are so helpful, draw two circles on your paper and make them socially distant. <laughs> Not, I'm just kidding. They don't have to be six feet apart. It could do sit four to six inches. will work fine. Okay. So the circles represent the neurons in our brain. Now, draw a straight line from one circle to the other circle. This line represents the stimulus created from a word, something as simple as a word. The stimulus begins to form a chemical and a physical pathway from one neuron to the other. Now, imagine repeating the same word over and over. So, with your pen or pencil, go back and forth from the circle to circle uh, like 10 times, right? You can see the line gets thicker with, with each back and forth pass. The line gets thicker because the chemical pathway is strengthened the more it's activated. That's where you get the saying, neuron, neurons that fire together wire together. Okay, so this is important because when we think about our language, the language that comes into your head and out of your mouth, if it's continuously negative, the bond is strengthened until ultimately it's so strong it becomes an automatic response. And, you know, interestingly enough, we're taught words matter as they relate to other people, but what we don't recognize is that words matter even more on how we think and interpret the world to ourselves. According to psychology today, it's easier to be negative because the brain barely responds to positive words and thoughts. There isn't that threat to survival, right? It makes sense. Negative words result in a rapid response because they're seen as a threat. So staying positive does take extra effort in the beginning, which means we need to repeatedly and consciously generate as many positive thoughts as we can each day. Psychological studies indicate you need to generate at least five positive messages for each negative thing you say. This impacts on what we read and the information we're getting in as well. The benefit of positive thoughts and words beyond the fact that they just improve your mood is that they literally prompt the motivational centers of your brain into action and help us build resilience when we're faced with problems. This is exactly what we need right now. When I think about the power of words, I often re reference a simple exercise I wanna share with you tonight. This is another reason why you needed your pen and paper. Okay, so our brain has two jobs, to answer our questions and prove us right. Well, if that's true, then if we think about this idea of language, let's explore the power of questions we ask ourselves. All right, so are you ready with your pen and paper? Because what you need to do is you need to draw a big triangle in the middle of your paper. And I'm gonna do this with you here in the station. Okay, and you're gonna divide the triangle into four blocks with three horizontal lines. All right, once you've done that, in the bottom block, you're going to write the word dying. In the next block up, you're going to write the word surviving. In the next block, you're going to write the word thriving. And in the very top, you're going to write the word flourishing. And so we make this triangle, dying at the bottom, surviving, thriving, and flourishing, because what we know is that we jump between these states of being. We're either dying, we're surviving, we're thriving, or we're flourishing. And the difference between where we are is often based on the questions we ask. And so the people who are dying, the biggest group of people, they ask themselves why. Why does this happen to me? Why am I here? The people who are surviving, they ask themselves how. How come I didn't get the raise? How come this always happens to me? The challenge with surviving and dying in these two questions, why and how, is that they force our brain backward. And so we have to go through the information we already have in order to come up with an answer. And remember what I said a couple of minutes ago, your brain has two jobs, to answer your questions and prove you right. And so your brain will go back and be like, oh wait, I can tell you why you didn't get the promotion. I can tell you how come you're always in the same situation. 
And so these questions we ask ourselves really matter. Because when we look at the people who are thriving, that next level up in the triangle, they ask themselves what? What do I do from here? What has to happen next? And the people who are flourishing ask themselves who? Who can help me? Who can I help? You can see that the top two questions, who and what, force your brain forward. It forces your brain out of what it already knows and puts you into instant activity. These simple changes in what we say can make a huge difference in how we show up. And it's important to know that certain behavioral styles naturally go toward certain questions. So if you're someone who naturally likes to know why, that's okay. Allow that question, but don't stay there. Allow yourself to explore the why and the how for a little bit. And I even tell clients to time it. Only allow yourself five minutes, ten minutes. And then begin to move forward and ask yourself the questions of what and who. I hope you find this helpful. I love this triangle and this simple change. Once you think about it, you're going to notice it. Start to notice the questions people are asking. And now we're going to put some of this information we've learned into practice. So let's do some live coaching. Mary Beth, are you there? Let's see. We might be having some technical problems. Mary Beth, are you yes. on? Oh, there you are. Hi. Yeah, I'm here. Hi. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm good. And I'm actually, I'm enjoying the show tonight. I, I really enjoyed the last segment that you just did because when I drew the triangle, I thought, yeah, here I am, a real estate agent, and I would like to believe that I'm thriving. I always want to be flourishing, yet I'm really cognizant during this time of seeming Pollyanna and seeming too optimistic, yet selfishly, I'm trying to guard my, my client, my client's business and their attitude. I'm trying to be a, um, a steward of, I don't want to say, I don't want to sound cliche when I'm working because I'm really so sensitive so like the whole thing, mm -hmm. like people making big moves and um, deciding, you know, that now is the time and they still want to go through with this. Yet there's so much skepticism by everyone looking in mm -hmm. that sometimes I'm... I'm, I could probably be bulldozed over by that. <laughs> mm. So what is, what is the biggest challenge you're facing right now in terms of minding your mindset? Um, I think in real estate, you know, we all, we all work for brokers unless we're our own broker, um, which I'm a broker, but I work for a bigger company. And it's, you you a lot of people probably compete with other people and I kind of compete with myself, I think. And so you don't, that's not what this period is about. This period is about helping people see that hopefully they can still get to the end of what their motivation in order to act, which would hopefully be moving or selling their home, um, that we can still do that. Yet, External influences affect everybody, and, uh, and me right. included. So, so for how, example, go, so go why not make sure that, you know, I use your time wisely. How can I help you best during this time? Because obviously as a realtor, you've got a lot going on. What's the best way to um, help everyone believe that it's still okay to plan and manage, like still think about their own lives. Mm. Like still think about their, without me thinking I'm intruding when it's what they asked me like a week ago, or it's, actually it would be probably a month ago now, a month and a half. 
Well, so that's such a great question. What is the best way to help everyone believe it's still okay to think about their future and their lives? And, you know, I think one of the biggest pieces of that is really coming out and asking your clients, what do you want during this time? And that, you know, it's taking it week by week because as we're seeing, things are changing week by week. And so that idea of what, what do you want for the next week will give you an opportunity to best service them in the way that they want to be serviced. Exactly. Or I think from where I usually come from, at least a positive moment Mm -hmm. in not, and I don't mean positive in a, in a, an unrealistic way, but like a, you know what? It's all okay. Right. Well, and that's what we talked about, you know, toward the beginning of the show is that idea of how our behavior shows up. And, you know, it is very natural for people who have a tendency to be optimistic. And you and I know each other and you are a naturally optimistic person um, that that it could be perceived as that. And even sharing that with your clients, you know, who may have a different approach or a different behavior and way of looking at it is that, you know, please know my my way is to always see the the bright side, to always look for um, the best in things. And so that's the approach I'm going to take during this time as well. And it kind of, you know, pre-frames how you're going to show up with them. Right. That's a great idea. And, and your energy oh, yeah. is such a gift. You don't want to be second-guessing yourself. It's that idea of owning it. Right. I didn't respond. Somebody asked me. They said, why wouldn't you just tell them to stay put? Like, ah, what they want to do. Right, they right. don't want to do <laughs> And so that's so interesting. And, um, you know, that's that, that, that's that other idea is everyone has a sense of what works for them. And therefore, we assume we know what works best for other people. And exactly. I think that that piece and recognizing, oh, you know what, that, that's perfect for you. Staying put would make sense for you. Staying put doesn't work for my clients. And, and having that, that honest conversation with people, too, um, I'm hoping will help change the energy around we t- the way we talk about this. Because, like I said at the beginning of the show, this is simply a change. People are seeing it as a negative change because our lifestyles are changing in ways we didn't select. But the reality is it doesn't have to be negative unless we make it negative. Exactly. I mean, they're obviously, you know... You know, I mean, I'm not being I'm not being blind to the to the um, all of the effort, of, you know, in the medical community. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not being blind to any of that. If anything, I'm trying to honor it and respect it mm-hmm. even more. But the truth is, they they also need us to continue. You know, like I mean, they need stores open a little bit later. They need and restaurants. They need us to to. Um, frequent, you know, or buy from them or go, go out, not out to dinner, but you know, um, what am I trying to say? Order takeout from right. them. You right. know, it's just, every, you're right. Everybody has their own perception. Right. Everybody's view is their own. And all I can do is, is try to listen mm-hmm. and, and hear and then, I mean, I guess just come from caring, you know, about mm-hmm. about theirs. And then, no, I don't, I don't need to impress mine upon them. Right. I mean, that's not the, that's not even what I'm, what I'm trying to do. It, it, it's hard though because it permeates, it just permeates every conversation. And being, so talk I about like that hard part. What would, what would <laughs> make it easier for you? Well, I would, I would like to be careful because I don't want to actually selfishly to permeate my mindset mm-hmm. so, you know? so that's such a great point what are you doing to and and know the questions that i'm asking mary beth are questions that i would have you at home ask yourself you know what are you doing to fill yourself up what are you doing to keep your mindset optimistic and and fresh and and thinking the way that you want to think well i'm i i am a huge believer in exercise Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm right. making sure that that happens every single day. I'm, um, I, I actually, 
I, I feel like the first week we were kind of all all over the place, off schedule. Not not really off schedule, but trying to figure it out. And then right. all of a sudden it was like, okay, we are we are getting back to the basics. We are just everybody in the house. We're getting back to a schedule. <laughs> we're getting back to okay. Let's just figure out how to deal with that now. Right. You know, like different things. Mm-hmm. I have adult children mm-hmm. who have come back home and, um, you know, trying to, I'm also trying to provide a little bit of grace because mm. I'd like to move a little bit faster than than I'm able to actually sometimes during this whole change that we're living through. So talk about that grace. How are you able to create that grace for yourself? That's such a beautiful um, word. Well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm trying to, um, I'm listening, believe it or not, a little bit more to, when I'm walking, I listen to some podcasts, and I, I heard one today, and it made me think, okay, there you go. He said, this is a change that's like Mount Everest, and all of these little challenges are just a cold, dark night on the side of the mountain. And I thought, well, now there you go. That's all it is. I know I'm, I know we're all climbing. We're all doing it. It's, the, whole con- the whole world is working through this. And if there's a moment or a piece on the timeline, it's a, just a cold, dark night. We just have to get through it. Tomorrow there's going to be the sun's going to come back up. It's going to be another day. We have confidence in that. You know, I mean, I'm, th- I'm thinking about some of these things. Well, and I mean, so, it helps me. The, the, so going to those places where you're getting information that's helpful is fantastic. The one shift I would make in that analogy is that I would not be on Mount Everest. I'd be on the side of a <laughs> ski slope where it's easy to get, you know, you can get up and down. People die on Everest. I'm not. And, you know, I get it. Like, you know, Corona it has, mm-hmm. can have the same effect. But in in. What we want to do is is remove that fear. So I want to use an analogy right. where people are like, oh, look, this can be safe. And yet with skiing, there is some danger in that. And people do right. die um, on, on ski mountains. But it's not like Everest where, you right. know, um, it's so right. extreme. So, again, great analogy. And your idea of going to people that give you information, that help you find a way through the day, that's such an important piece of what we need to be doing to fill ourselves up, you know, guarding our mindset and guarding our energy by surrounding ourselves with people and information that fill us up is so important. Well, you know, even humor, mm-hmm. I mean, humor, humor has always been a gift. My mother used to always say, as so many moms, I think this too shall pass. Right. But when you look at people who are, there was somebody from the Oprah show and, and the, the Irish woman was like, huh? follow the rules you'll all be fine and i thought well no there you go <laughs> that's simple a wise that's woman simple. <laughs> let's just bring it down to the bare bones follow the rules <laughs> right and you'll all be fine there you go you know? fantastic I'm like okay well now there you go she's like 98 how many of these different things mm-hmm. in the world are in her right. in her lifetime has she seen so true so true. And ha- and having that resilience. Um, I think that's right. the other part of, you know, right now looking at m- most of us have led these blessed existence and we haven't had to go through extreme challenges like a depression and a war. Right. And, and so this is a huge challenge for us. And yet when we put it in the perspective of those other things, wow, we can handle this. This one, this exactly. one we will get through. Well, we get through exactly. all of them is the reality. How we get through, right. through them is our choice. Exactly. And exactly. that's really, really oh, the key. Great. Oh, yeah. well. You're fantastic. <laughs> so, Mary Beth, anything else that you want to focus on tonight before we close down our last two minutes? No, you know what? I think the only additional thing with me is that um, I, I do lean on my faith. Mm. I can't, I'm not going to lie. I think sometimes when I think, oh, Lord, I just don't know how I'm going to make it through this one, I kind of think, uh, you know what, I don't need to know. I don't need to have all the answers because my faith um, is is what will allow me the ability to think I'm 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 rowing the boat. <laughs> That's all I'm doing. I'm just rowing. Yep. Hopefully, I mean, not hopefully. I know it's going in the direction I've got it pointed, but there's there's someone you know bigger than me that's you know also 
also in the know. That's all. That is you know? a perfect way to close our time today. Thank you so much, Mary Beth, for calling in. As always, it's great to talk to you. Thank you for joining me tonight. As always, I love hearing your thoughts and getting your feedback on the show. Visit the Own Your Truth with RT Facebook page and comment. RT on Own Your Truth, hear you then. Good night. Thank you.